Hi, this is Duncan Ferguson. In this unit, we're going to talk about uh, vitamin D, PTH, that is parathyroid hormone, and calcitonin. And uh, we'll be talking about them all together. It's very difficult to break out one or the other because they're so closely intertwined. And this will be maybe, therefore, a little bit longer unit. But I think it's important that you see all of these sort of working together uh, to impact the, particularly the ionized calcium in the circulation. In, in this uh, slide, we have sort of an overview of everything we're going to talk about, and it's sort of the rule of threes. There are three tissues that infl are involved in calcium handling. Uh, they are the gut, the bone, and the kidney. And so the gut's involved in uh, intake absorption and, of course, excretion of calcium. Bone, of course, is storing it and releasing it uh, as, as the animal needs it. Or, and then the kidney can um, excrete calcium. There are th three basic processes at each of these tissues. Calcium is absorbed in the gut. We have In the bone, we have both resorption and, dep and deposition of calcium. And... In the kidney, we can have calcium reabsorption, determining how much is actually excreted. And, of course, the three hormones that we're going to talk about in great detail in this unit are PTH, 125-hydroxyvitamin uh, D, D, or D3, which we also can call calcitriol, and calcitonin. Um, PTH and calcitonin are peptides, whereas vitamin D is a small lipophilic molecule. We'll talk more about it. So to reiterate, the three calcium regulating compounds are a small lipophilic molecule called vitamin D, or it's an activated form, 125-hydroxyvitamin D. We'll talk about how it's activated. Then we have the peptides parathyroid hormone. I'll just go ahead and say right up front, vitamin D and parathyroid hormone tend to increase calcium if we're focusing on calcium. And calcitonin tend to decrease it. So we'll review this in detail throughout this unit. Let's talk about the sources of vitamin D. Firstly, vitamin D is not really considered a classic hormone uh, because it's not produced and secreted by an endocrine gland. Um, its sources uh, can be from the diet, and that can be from plant sources, where we call it uh, basically vitamin D2 or ergocalciferol, or vitamin D3, if it's from animal sources, that's called cholecalciferol. In the skin of most mammals, but not dog and cat, we have the uh, production of vitamin D in the beige area of the skin by activation of a precursor by UV radiation. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. Let's first talk about how vitamin D acts and, and what it looks like as a molecule. It's a, a small lipophilic steroid hormone molecule, also made from uh, cholesterol. And it's carried uh, in the bloodstream, because it's not very happy being an aqueous solution, via a protein called vitamin D binding protein. Vitamin D binding protein, or DBP. And therefore, as with, with glucocorticoids and thyroid hormone, the free hormone hypothesis applies. That means that it's the unbound or free hormone that actually uh, will have its activity. And how does it work? It acts through a nuclear vitamin D receptor, which forms a heterodimer with retinoic acid receptors. So to, to look at um, how these work, uh, we're looking at the right-hand side of this figure, and we're noting that the receptor for vitamin D called VDR, and it actually prefers 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. We'll talk about how that's made from vitamin D given orally or created in the skin. Uh, it, but it binds a nuclear receptor uh, interacts with the, the hormone response element, but it has its tightest binding when it is in a heterodimer with the retinoic acid receptor. Uh, and so this is why we call this type of receptor a heterodimeric uh, 
uh, nuclear receptor. And of course, what it's doing after that is to alter messenger RNA production and then translation of proteins. So let's now talk about the synthesis of vitamin D, or what we really want to say is the active forms of vitamin D. And I mentioned that it's a, um, it's a product of cholesterol, and actually if you look at the top right-hand corner of the slide, you'll see that uh, for those species, uh, other than the dog and the cat, you can make from D7-dehydrocholesterol, you get a pre-vitamin D precursor in exposure to light, and then uh, this exchanges and develops uh, into vitamin D3. And vitamin D3, we mentioned already, is the animal version of vitamin D. Now, what happens when you ingest uh, vitamin D, or if the vitamin D is made already? This would be the dog bowl over here. Dog or cat would require ingestion of vitamin D. And then we have, it's inactive in that form and it requires modification for activation. And what that modification is, is the first step occurs in the liver and that's the formation of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So it's a 25 hydroxylation of vitamin D. And then it goes to the kidney and it can be either activated to 125 hydroxy D, and we'll talk about how that's an important regulated step or inactivated to 24, 25 uh, dihydroxy vitamin D on the right. And in this on and off switch is an important regulation step that occurs at the kidney. So that second regulation, uh, second hydroxylation is a regulated step. We'll get back to the uh, regulation of the activation of vitamin D in a bit, but what I want to first talk about is the action of vitamin D. And the first tissue that I want to talk about its action in is the intestine. Uh, what does it do in the intestine? Well, it activates the active absorption of calcium in, in mostly in the proximal small intestine. And so how does it do this? It does this by stimulating basically four proteins. What are those proteins? If you look at this figure on the right, uh, you have the stimulation of, of vitamin D, uh, an alkaline phosphatase called AP. That's alkaline phosphatase. It's not written in the slides, but I'll write it out. And then you have also the stimulation of a protein that helps move calcium through the cell. So that's the transcellular movement. And this uh, protein is called calbindin calcium binding protein or calbindin. And then you have two transporters. One is linked directly to ATP, and that's the calcium ATPase on the basolateral or circulation side, and also the sodium-linked calcium exchanger or sodium-calcium exchanger. What's, where's the energy coming from there? It's coming from the sodium-potassium ATPase. And so um, through these mechanisms, you have active movement of calcium uh, from the brush border or the lumen of the intestine through to the circulation. Now there's also passive mo movement of calcium and this is it's important to recognize even in the absence of vitamin D you can get significant amounts of uh, absorption by passive concentration dependent mechanism. So giving an animal excess calcium orally is a fairly safe thing to do and a certain percentage of that will get across just by passive uh, non-vitamin D dependent movement. Uh, now, vitamin D also stimulates phosphate absorption but does this in the distal uh, small intestine. Okay, let's take a look at the second tissue, the bone, where vitamin D has its action. And import, the important thing is that you recognize that it is affecting enhanced calcium resorption from bone, which is a major store, as we said before, for calcium for the animal. And its action is on osteoblasts, an increased uh, osteoblast number. Uh, and what are osteoblasts doing? So if you look at the upper slide here, the osteoblasts are sort of uh, in, pre in place, uh, and they are separating the bone-resorbing osteoclasts from the bone. 
And so under the influence, if you look at the effects of vitamin D, or we'll just add in there because it's worth talking about now, uh, PTH, parathyroid hormone, you then see the movement of in uh, the attraction and activation of the osteoclast, osteoclast to lead to sites of bone resorption. And uh, this is, uh, and we'll preview what's going on with calcitonin. Calcitonin will lead to the retraction, again, of the osteoclast from the bone and, re and therefore uh, reduce the amounts of bone resorption. But overall, um, calcitriol will, will impact the uh, amount of osteoid production by osteoblasts. It will impact the, uh, it lead to the resorption of calcium from the bone matrix by osteoclast. And PTH um, basically uh, is also involved in this, and vitamin D kind of sets up as permissive for PTH's action on the osteoblast to lead to all of these effects, ultimately to enhance calcium resorption from bone. Now, calcitriol or activated vitamin D is required for proper bone formation. And so when you have the absolute absence of calcitriol, which you can see with rickets, uh, as a dog on the right with rickets, um, you have an excess amount of osteoid that accumulates and don't have mineralization of this osteoid. And this becomes a condition where this, uh, you have basically a rubber leg type situation, as you're seeing, an improper formation of bones uh, in the absence of vitamin D. Let's now turn to the third tissue where vitamin D has its action. We also said it was activated uh, to 125-hydroxy vitamin D uh, in the kidney, but it also has an action on the kidney. Vitamin D will increase the renal reabsorption in the distal tubule of calcium. That's the um, the way that it retains calcium within the body for use uh, in the extracellular fluid. And it also impacts uh, the reabsorption of phosphate in the proximal tubule through enhancing the amount of the sodium phosphate exchanger. And it does this in conjunction with PTH. It also has some of an effect on um, sodium reabsorption by the kidney as well. Now this is a fairly complex slide, but uh, we'll talk you through it. Uh, it's probably, uh, of all the slides I've shown you here in this presentation, this is probably the, the most important because it kind of summarizes things. So you might want to stop the video and take a good look at it uh, carefully uh, after listening to what I have to say. So the, the, the renal 1-alpha hydroxylase, which we said was the active, it's a final activation step for vitamin D, and it's handled at the kidney. Remember we said the first step was a... Um, 25-hydroxy uh, vitamin D being formed at the liver, and that's basically being dependent upon how much vitamin D is available in the animal. So the actual measurement of 25-hydroxy vitamin D is a good indicator of vitamin D availability. However, its active status, that is, at, and its action at all the tissues we talked about, is dependent on 125 dihydroxy vitamin D being made. And this is a regulated step handled by the 1-alpha hydroxylase. And so that's what I'm listing here as an activation step on the left-hand side. So we get vitamin D in. It comes from the liver. That's 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And then it's activated to 125-hydroxy vitamin D. So let's take a look at all of the factors that will stimulate this activity. Well, directly we see PTH, okay? We see um, the, re the reduction of calcium will stimulate it, and the reduction of phosphate will stimulate it, as well as the increase of calcitonin. So these, all of these things in sort of feedback loop way will increase the activation of vitamin D. Now, what's the feedback that stops this? Well, it's the actual formation of 125-hydroxy-D, and you can see right here that um, that's a negative impact on PTH secretion. And so 
in many ways, that's where your loop is. Now, what's the alternative pathway um, for vitamin uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D for its metabolism? It's 24 hydroxylase uh, activity to 24 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And this is an inactivation uh, step. And you can see all the factors that will impact it. They're more or less the opposite. Um, so everything that activates 1-hydroxylase will inactivate um, the 24-hydroxylase, and that's a fairly safe thing. And there's not much effect of PTH on 24-hydroxylase. So to reiterate, the closure of the negative feedback loop is the actual production of vitamin D, calcitriol, 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D, which inhibits PTH, um, and reduces 1-alpha hydroxylase. And it also uh, will tend to stimulate, it's maybe a slight difference, it will stimulate uh, vitamin D, that is, and the negative feedback will stimulate the inactivation pathway. So you can see there's this uh, wonderful negative feedback loop that's where the activation or uh, production of 125-hydroxy vitamin D will sort of um, end this further activation of um, 25 to 125 uh, when there's enough 125 available. So let's now talk about uh, parathyroid hormone or PTH. PTH is an 84 amino acid um, peptide single chain that's synthesized by a proteolytic cleavage of a pre-pro hormone. Uh, the amino acid sequences of canine and feline PTH are highly homologous with the sequence of this peptide in other mammalian species. The intact 1 to 84 uh, amino acid molecule is the major circulating form of PTH, but the full biological activity of the intact hormone resides only within the amino terminal 1 to 34 amino acid segment. And these are produced by, PTH is produced by the chief cells of the parathyroid gland, and you can see in the figure on the right that uh, we have, uh, and this is clinically important, we have uh, what are caudal or internal parathyroid glands, and we have cranial external parathyroid glands. And obviously, if you have to take the thyroid out, um, you're going to have to take the internal parathyroids out. And this is pretty typical um, problem with a thyroidectomy that occurs because, let's say, of hyperthyroidism in a cat. And so what you need to do is to maintain the external parathyroids or at least put them back into the animal under the skin because they'll function uh, as endocrine tissue uh, after revascularizing. So what's the major regulatory um, uh, factor that leads to PTH secretion? Well, it's plasma ionized calcium. So as ionized calcium falls, PTH rises, and we'll talk about that in more detail with a graph uh, in the next slide. But in addition, the other, another regulator, a uh, negative regulator for PTH secretion is the production of 125 uh, vitamin D3. Uh, which has a minor effect on reducing PTH gene expression. Okay, so we said that ionized calcium regulates PTH. How does it do this? Uh, so if we look at, on the x-axis, the um, ionized calcium and PTH on the y-axis over here, you can see that as calcium, ionized calcium falls, PTH rises. And, and it can be sort of characterized as a negative sigmoidal relationship. And so what this would look like is that if you consider uh, that there's a midpoint to this inflection point, so to speak, we, this is the set point for the relationship between ionized calcium and between uh, and PTH elevation. And notice that this is actually um, surrounded by the physiological range. So you can see the body is very carefully titrating the amount of PTH to respond to calcium, and, and, and in this case, particularly to a reduction of calcium. So how does this happen at the parathyroid cell? Uh, well, if we look at the red uh, text, uh, 
you can see the first thing it would be increased in ionized calcium will actually be detected by what's called the calcium sensing receptor. And this leads to phospholipase A, uh, C, phospholipase C, uh, stimulating an increase in parathyroidal cell uh, calcium inside the cell, which actually, in contrast to, say, insulin, it will, which, where calcium would increase fusion of granules, in this case, calcium intracellularly decreases fusion of PTH granules and therefore leads to be decreased PTH secretion. And there's actually a, a drug class that's targeted at this, uh, at this receptor uh, characterized by the drug sinicalcid. So these are calcium sensing receptor agonists. And so it basically uh, takes the place of calcium and helps to reduce PTH in conditions where path TTH is pathologically elevated, uh, where it's causing uh, problems for the organism, for the patient. And this would be, for example, uh, renal secondary hyperparathyroidism. And so this drug has been tried and has been studied a little bit in veterinary medicine for this purpose. So what are the actions of PTH? Well, first of all, they increase calcium levels, and they do that just like vitamin D. Um, but unlike vitamin D, they decrease plasma phosphate levels. So there's this discord between calcium, which goes up, and phosphate, which goes down in the influence of PTH. Now, the actions of PTH on the bone are mainly to stimulate calcium resorption. But on the kidney... Um, they will increase calcium by increasing reabsorption of it in the distal tubule. And we already mentioned PTH um, acts to activate vitamin D, and it will inhibit the tubular, proximal tubular reabsorption of phosphate uh, that will lead to lower phosphate levels. And this is different than vitamin D. So in summary, the extracellular fluid calcium, ionized calcium, will go up uh, and up, and then phosphate goes down and activated, or 125 vitamin D goes up following PTH. Our final regulator of calcium is calcitonin, and it too is a peptide hormone uh, made by the parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland. And what does it respond to? It responds to high ionized calcium. It's secreted in response to high calcium. And what its job is to do is to decrease plasma calcium levels. And it does this uh, primarily by inhibiting bone resorption. And we talked about it uh, basically moving the osteoclasts away from the bone. It also increases urinary excretion of calcium, and it inhibits somewhat calcium uh, absorption from the intestine. Uh, the effects are less prominent uh, than vitamin D and uh, in, this, in this regard. While PTH and vitamin D act to increase plasma calcium, only calcitonin can cause a decrease in plasma calcium. This is the only factor, the only, and it's a peptide, that can decrease plasma calcium. So the actual role of calcitonin, what, it, what it's supposed to do, is, is not really well understood other than its effect to uh, impact the uh, osteoclast activity. Um, you would think it would be a physiological antagonist to parathyroid hormone, but it doesn't seem to be doing that, and therefore its major role seems to be in the control of the remodeling of bone, as we showed in the previous figure. So in summary, uh, the intestine, the bone, and the kidney are the three major sites of calcium and phosphate homeostasis. Uh, primary regulators are also three, 125 dihydroxyvitamin D, PTH, and calcitonin. Vitamin D is a lipophilic molecule that acts through a, nu a nuclear heterodimeric receptor, uh, heterodimeric with the retinoic acid receptor. Uh, the activation of vitamin D takes place in two steps. Um, well, the first step is not an activation. It's the first important step, however, is 25-hydroxylation by the liver, and this is dependent mainly on the amount of vitamin D availability. And we said that measuring 25-hydroxy vitamin D is a, is a good indicator of, say, nutritional availability of vitamin D. Or if you have a toxicity that you suspect, 
you could measure 25-hydroxy vitamin D to confirm it. 1-hydroxylation is the important regulated activating step that occurs in the kidney, and it's regulated by PTH uh, on the positive side, ionized calcium on the negative side, and uh, phosphate also. 125-hydroxy uh, vitamin D increases ionized calcium and phosphate, uh, and yet cal and calcium, ionized calcium will inversely or negatively uh, impact PTH. Uh, the peptide PTH, on the other side, increases ionized calcium and decreases phosphate through actions on the bone and the kidney, and then the peptide calcitonin is stimulated by high calcium, ionized calcium, and it acts to decrease it, we think mainly through its effects on altering bone resorption.